The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwm.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. And with the transmitters, we are able to gather data on where the turtles go after they're done nesting for that season. We wanted a place for the family to hunt, but it became much more than that over time. It's actually turned into a chance to give a bit back. My name is Richard Roberts, and I was executive producer of the Texas Parks and Wildlife TV series from 1989 to 2013. And one of my favorite stories I worked on was an early story I did with photographer Wyman Munson. outside for 30 years. From the Gulf Coast to the mountains of West Texas, biologists have followed to the best of their abilities the habits and lives of Texas wildlife. Now scientists can better pinpoint exactly where wildlife travels by using the newest GPS technology. From 12,000 miles above the Earth, satellites are helping us track wildlife with detail and ease. Each spring, Kemp's Ridley sea turtles come to the Texas shore to perform one of nature's wonders by laying their eggs. Months later, their young hatch and begin their journey through life. Every new hatchling gives hope that this endangered species won't go extinct. The mothers have long since returned to the sea but their exact whereabouts a mystery until now. We're conducting this tracking because we want to get an idea about the habitat usage by these adult females. We want to see uh, where they're going in the marine environment, which is where they spend the vast majority of their life, where they're going for migration, as well as for foraging when they're done nesting. We are affixing satellite transmitters to Kemp's Ridley turtles that nested on the Texas coast so we can follow their migratory pathways and look for any foraging hot spots in the Gulf of Mexico. Once the turtle is in her trance while she's actually laying eggs, we will take a, a swipe sample from her carapace and then we will put her in a transport vehicle and take her a brief ride to the turtle laboratory at Padron National Seashore. We put a little towel over the eyes of the turtle because sometimes it, this helps to calm the turtle. She will have a blood sample that is withdrawn and there will be small biopsy tissue samples taken for use with various studies. We have to sand the shell. We put down the first layer of the epoxy, which is cool as it dries, and then we'll fix the transmitter. Then when it's on there very well and solid, we will paint the surface to help prevent barnacles from adhering onto that area where it has been applied. The whole process takes about three hours. 
every time we release a turtle, it is a meaningful experience to us. This is an endangered species. We want to make sure that it's released back on the beach in very healthy and vigorous condition. Many people have been involved in conservation work for Kemp's Ridley turtles. It's a cooperative effort that makes it special, and it's one step closer towards hopefully recovering the species someday so that it can be enjoyed by future generations. The public can actually see the tracks for these nesting turtles. They go to www.seaturtle.org and look for the Padral National Seashore Kemp's Ridley Tracking Project. And then they will see a map for all of the turtles that we're tracking for this year's transmitters deployed. And then they will be able to actually click on the links to the specific turtles and see the individual maps. Over 500 miles away in the mountains of West Texas, another species fights to survive. Historically, the native Texas desert bighorn sheep occurred in about 16 mountain ranges. But by the early 1960s, they were gone, mostly due to unregulated hunting and disease. Texas Parks and Wildlife and others have worked to restore the bighorns to their native Texas mountain ranges. But capturing and tracking these elusive animals is challenging in this vast West Texas desert. The way we capture these is, is through a net gun and a helicopter. And what they do is they'll go out and uh, somewhat selectively uh, route them in the direction that they want, and then they fire a net gun on them. They fly up and they bank and they come back and they turn around. And it's almost like a, like a fast-paced roller coaster ride. We have sources, uh, in-state sources now, that we can go to and capture from and, and, and relocate to other to other mountain ranges. You look up at the mountain and here you see the bubble of the helicopter and then you see the thing attached at the bottom and you know they're sheep. And as they get closer, there they are. Okay. Once at the processing station, they're aged. You want to take a picture of the team? Yeah. You take fecal samples. They also take a blood samples. Four plus. Four plus. <laughs> and those radio collars are, are there to help us monitor the bighorns. GPS, 0434. So that's where we get movement and uh, identify other variables such as travel corridors. The restoration effort has been going on for more than 50 years. And, you know, it's now paying off where we have surplus populations. Uh, you know, they're thriving. We're almost halfway there. Our goal is to have all of the 15 or 16 mountain ranges that have critical habitat for them to have a big horns. It wasn't a couple hours ago that they were at Elephant Mountain. Now here they are in their new home. Now they'll be here for, for, for the public to enjoy. And that to me is, is wonderful. Our satellite collars that we have now have really uh, kind of amped up our game as far as technology goes because they allow us to monitor bighorn movements pretty much real time. You can watch them anywhere in the world. And it's pretty fascinating how they move from one place to another. We see that ram, he crosses into Mexico, travels down the mountaintops quite a good ways, at least 25 miles from the release site. The ewes kind of doing their thing, staying, staying around pretty close to the release site within you know, the seven mile radius. Really, really interesting how they move like that. Satellite collars will play a key role in the future. 
Biologists now learn more about our native and endangered wildlife faster and easier than ever before. And the more we know, the better and smarter we can work to conserve our wildlife for future generations. As I got involved in this, I didn't realize how complex an ecosystem that native prairie grass really is. The biggest component of all this is patience. This is a recreational property and they use it to hunt, but they've also recognized that none of that's possible unless the habitat's here that produces that wildlife that we all love and enjoy and like to hunt and see. My name is Frank Gore and uh, we're here in Jackson County on the Gore family property. We uh, purchased this property in 2007. We're pretty close to the salt water, about 20 miles by road to Palacios. Near here is Karankawa Creek, which becomes Karankawa Bay and which becomes the headwaters from Atagorda Bay. So we're in the flyway here. We wanted a place for the family to hunt, but it became much more than that over time. It's actually turned into a chance to give a bit back. The neatest part about the management that's going on out here is really the completeness of it and the way it really addresses every aspect of the ecosystem and the wildlife needs on the property. The habitat that Mr. Gore provides out here does a really good job of mimicking the natural condition of this Gulf Coast Prairie ecoregion. It provides a real mosaic of upland and wetland habitat. We put up around 350 to 400 acres of water every winter for waterfowl. Not only is it providing open water for waterfowl in the fall, but also overwintering habitat for waterfowl, upland habitat for the resident game bird species, and also birds like model duck that, that stay here year round. Great nesting habitat at the base of these, these native bunch grasses. Never comes as fast as you want, but we're right now light years ahead of where we were. Heck of a start. It was a former rice farm which had gone to cattle grazing for about eight years before we bought it. In the cattle grazing days, uh, they had planted Bermuda grass and it was pervasive and uh, was really detrimental to the native songbirds as well as the uh, upland birds that we were trying to foster on the place. So we began the process of habitat restoration and, and rehabilitation. We worked very early with Mr. Gore using herbicide and doing multiple applications within each growing season before we even came in and planted. When we're storing native grass, 90% of the battle is controlling the exotic grass that's out there. I was a 250 acre native grass receding project, so it was uh, significant in size, uh, one of the largest I know of. We could use a couple more hundred Mr. Gores in Jackson County alone, I think. <laughs> My earliest recollection of being outdoors was sleeping on the floor of a duck blind at four or five years old under my dad's coat. So I come from a long family history of duck hunters. The whole idea was to be able to give something back and be able to pass it down. Down the way my grandkids can tell their grandkids. This is what we started and started way back in the beginning of time at 2007. <laughs> The main justification is so that my grandkids will know what a cubby of quail sounds like calling each other in the morning and what it looks like to send up, you know, 300 ducks off of a pond and, and watch them whirl around and come back in. And that's something that you, your money just can't buy. It's been a lot of work that the family and I have put into this, as well as money. but. Uh, definitely would do it again.
It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. Richard Roberts is one of more than 30 producers, photographers, writers, and editors who have contributed to the show since its first broadcast in 1985. My name is Richard Roberts, and I was executive producer of the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife TV series from 1989 to 2013. And one of my favorite stories I worked on was an early story I did with photographer Wyman Menzer, a fellow who works up in the Panhandle. Big fan of his work, and when I got a chance to work with him, I was, it was just pretty tickled getting to, to know the guy. And what struck me was his generosity in sharing setups with me where he had built blinds for attracting wildlife and just great setups for photographing wildlife. And he just sort of invited me into his world and let me uh, participate in that, and I really appreciated that. Uh, he's a character, for sure. In this part of Texas, I can sort of see what it used to be like. You know, it's my only touch, it's my only connection with Texas a hundred years ago. It's almost like in another life I was there. As a young man, Wyman Menzer began a search for that other life. In the early 1970s, for three years, he lived alone, hunting and trapping, making his living off the land. What he learned during that time would serve him well in the years to come. Today, Wyman Menzer makes his living with a camera, specializing in the wildlife and landscapes of North Texas. His photographs have appeared in publications throughout the world. He's widely respected as one of the best in his field. Wyman believes his background in hunting and trapping has played an important role in his success. If you have a background like myself where you've spent years in close proximity to, to a, a wild animals, you can actually read body language of certain, uh, whether it's birds, whether it's mammals. And, uh, and I can be around an animal for a little while, especially if he's gonna be accepting of my presence for a while, say for instance on roadrunners. And I can actually, uh, most of the time, tell what or predict what that creature is gonna be doing in the next couple of minutes. Don't be alarmed. I'm just gonna take a reading here and see what her light is. It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. I'm 16, okay? Let's go see what your mom and dad's got for you. Mice seem to be pretty fragile. It doesn't take much for a roadrunner to kill one. They don't take nearly as long in the killing of a mouse. Good action. Good action. Come on. It never ceases to amaze me to watch them feed. Especially, especially so whenever the, the uh, prey uh, species is such a size that it takes a while for the little ones to go ahead and accept it. Then there's a lot of interaction between the adult and the, uh, the young. Uh, a lot of vocalization. I'm, I'm gonna say some sort of enticement of some sort. That's whenever I'm, I, I became so involved in listening, sometimes I miss a shot. It's just, it never ceases to amaze me. It's very fascinating to watch them. I love these two roadrunners. I feel toward them like I would a dog I've had for years. It, it's just like I've known them forever. And I, I'm not ashamed to say if something happens to them, I, I'll probably break down and cry.
The dramatic landscapes of the Texas Canyonlands are another favorite subject for the camera of Wyman Menzer. These uh, raccoon tracks are interesting in that uh, they lead up into the canyon, sort of a sort of tells a story in a way. And uh, I'm going to try. The only problem I have is that uh, there's not a lot of shadow in them to really bring them out. But I'm going to go ahead and take a shot and. And if it doesn't work out, well, really, there's not much lost. However, it might work out. This is looking better. Set it at a hyperfocal distance where everything in the foreground and background will be in focus. These rugged canyons were once a haven for the Comanches, who etched records of their lives into the soft red sandstone. Their carved pictures from the past are soon to be captured on film. It's really good that this uh, is in a cavern type situation. The dirt stays on the floor all the time and covers the artwork because it'll minimize some of the weathering effect. This sandstone really has a tendency to react to a lot of moisture and disintegrate over a period of time. It needs to be remembered, too, that even brushing over a period of years might have an effect on this, so it needs to be brushed lightly. Sandstone really deteriorates. For this series of photographs, longtime friend Knut Milhouse has agreed to pose for the camera. All right, now then have like one hand rested on the rock. There you go, just kind of like, you know, it's real natural. There you go. It's best, I think, to put this dust back over the glyphs to protect them from further weathering. Just like it was left, we found it. We're going to leave it the same way. You know, I've been, I've gone to Alaska and shot things for Field and Stream, and uh, Parks and Wildlife has has uh, asked me to, to shoot some things for them. And, uh, and I love doing this. It's a challenge to me, you know. It's, I, I'm, I'm the, I guess I'm the kind of person who, who uh, and I'm not saying this is good, I'm just saying that I'm the type of person who has to, who must be faced with some sort of a challenge. From time to time, Wyman still visits the site of his first big challenge. The cabin is still there, somewhat disheveled nearly 20 years later. Today, Wyman Menzer lives in the nearby North Texas town of Benjamin, a man clearly focused on his life's work. I just like to photograph. I love to create great pictures. I don't tire of my work. Uh, I enjoy every day. I hope that each day will give me something new to look forward to, and it, and it generally does, uh, an adventure of some sort. So I really can't imagine doing anything else.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.